Um, no, 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 I just want to welcome you. I just want to introduce you. So the next uh, panel will be moderated by Professor Toshiko Mori, who's from the GSD, um, and the Robert P. Hubbard Professor in Practice of Architecture. Toshiko is also not only working as an architect, but really as a product designer now, and involved with the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Design and Innovation. So she covers both these worlds. So um, Toshiko and the panel will come. I think everybody. Yeah, and then Kara. Uh, we'll get started because we are on a time clock. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Toshiko Mori um, of That's GSD. Me. This is my home ground. And, uh, and then I'm very happy to house. have uh, amazing panelists with me this afternoon. And I will quickly introduce uh, panelists. To my left is Mr. Murray Moss, a legend for us, especially I live and work in New York. In the Soho, he had a gallery for 18 years, no? nearly, yeah. right, right. And it really was a prominent design gallery. And uh, he had worked with many manufacturers and designers to display products. To a lot of extent, we didn't have to go to MoMA. We just have to go to his gallery <laughs> instead. <Ooh. laughs> oh, Paula, I'm sorry, but I'm sure she will agree with me. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> but, uh, okay, we all love you. So, uh, but most yeah. recently, he has been working with uh, Philip Dupree Auction House, and this Tuesday he had an amazing auction results, which I heard, I have a source in the auction house, told me 2,500 people, more than that, showed up, and you had a very, very successful auction of objects. And if you look at their website, there's fantastic uh, YouTube of Moss, uh, Murray Moss uh, talking about on decoration, on uh, good taste, and also on uh, living with art, which is absolutely precious little YouTubes that you can watch. And the center, I'd like to introduce Kara McCarty. We are balanced gender in this panel. I'm very happy. <laughs> and uh, she is a curatorial director of Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. And during her career, uh, which she began her career at Museum What or Not, and I'm very lucky that I had occasion to work with her on some exhibitions. And then also she has gone to St. Louis Art Museum and uh, she was the head of decorative arts and design. And then now she has come back to New York to be the curatorial director of Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt. And I have focused on design innovation and overlap between design and technology and art. So some of her uh, projects include diagramming microchips, designs for independent living, products for people with disabilities, masks, faces of culture. And she was a love fellow here at the GSD in 2006, so she's very familiar with the school, the faculty, students, how we operate. So welcome back, Kara. Thank you. And uh, the Joseph Becker is assistant curator of architecture and design at uh, San Francisco MoMA since 2008. And from that time, majority of San Francisco MoMA's art and design shows uh, is actually done by Joseph. So, and includes a cut revealing the section, uh, bodies and design, how wine became modern design. And many of his uh, projects in it really addresses experimentation of design and cutting edge and defining what design can be. And currently there's a show called Field Conditions, which is operating right now. So uh, I'd like to quickly uh, contextualize by going to my Yes. Do you need help? Do you want to sit here, Tushika? Um, yeah. you want to change places with me? Just is no. This, is this your presentation? No, no. My name on it. So this is who's this? That's Kara's. Kara. Because I just want to introduce, contextualize it in terms of what I do. As Mohsen mentioned, I'm one of a few professors who was very much interested in design and architecture. And I'm I actually, contrary to Jacques Herzog, I think it's one totally single discipline, because if you really look at the body of work of Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, Frank Lloyd Wright, Marcel Breuer, 
they've always designed objects in architecture, buildings and cities. Geopont is another one, so it's a matter of scale and size. But also I like to say that there's a relationship to a body, as Jonathan described in description, which may be very different. So quickly, I'm doing a studio with a student called Kyoto Studio, and I took 12 students to Kyoto, to ancient capital of southern years. It is because it's such a total environment, has to do with nature, uh, art, architecture, and, uh, and buildings and how buildings and crafts are integrated. The brief is to study traditional crafts. Kyoto Institute of Technology, where we went, has an institute called Future of Tradition to study the traditional crafts and then to apply it to future use. And also, especially for globally humanitarian issues, just because Kyoto has been an ancient capital, but it has been a fragile state, suffered from war, fire, typhoon, hurricane, earthquakes. So those crafts are really made to withstand some of the stresses and then some of the uh, tragedies of a civilization over the years. And there's an amazing amount of knowledge to be harvested. So take GSG students to these spaces, and then here it is, they're barefoot. They are very smart students, are from numerically centered. They said, the best thing they said, oh my God, in the space. I can smell, I can hear things, I can feel things. So to a lot of extent, GSD environment is really isolated from other sensory human experiences. And in addition, what we looked at is how the nature architecture might be integrated and how the blurring, the boundary blurring between buildings and cities and the way people live is in fact an amazing experience for them to understand how close it is and it's really disciplinary boundary really should be much more broadly described. And we looked at the man who made this Kyoto wall for thousands of years and students are looking at the secret of how they withstood earthquake for thousand years, which turns out with there's a bacteria which is grown inside, which is makes them strong. And then layer of uh, elements, looking at truths, understanding it, and also hands-on experience with a master ceramicist making a ceramic, really getting their hand dirty. But ceramics, it takes your body to really operate it, to understand how to make things. And then lastly, we are working with umbrella maker. He's one of the last we left in Kyoto to make bamboo umbrellas from a beginning. And uh, again, this is very sophisticated advanced technique. And then this is something which really crosses this idea of tradition, techniques, the skill, knowledge. I think your question is really something that really is a common ground between architecture and design, planning, and landscape. So by introducing this, I'm actually saying that all the curators here, what do they do which is very common? which is highly engaging, they also engage us with the experience. That it's intimacy of objects and the intimacy of space between what we do, how we live, has a lot to do with how they present the work. The curatorial activity is a very interesting one. They collect, they select, they edit, they promote, they conserve and preserve, they share, they also uh, promote and share, and also they recommend, they choose, and they give definition to taste, they give definition to values. And um, what's really interesting about their curation is opposed to perhaps fine arts where institutions might have an agenda or set standard, each curator has to establish his or her own agenda or criteria, and you have to keep a value system renewed all the time. So uh, by just prefacing their work, I think we will start the presentation by Claire McCarty first. Okay, thank you very much, Toshiko. Um, makes me want to become a student again, so I can take, because uh, so I can go to Kyoto and try all those, my hand at some of those crafts. Um, and I would like to say I think this is a very exciting way to uh, end National Design Week by having a conference at the Graduate School of Design to 
to think about how the school might uh, address design going forward. So very, very, very befitting. Um, and I'd also like to thank Dean Mostafavi, um, Jonathan, Chantal, I know there's others involved in the planning of this, but thank you very much. I, it was just a few weeks ago when we were on the phone and I can hardly believe we're here right now. So before I get started, I would like to just read a quote from the late Bill Moggridge, which I think is very apropos to today's session. And he said, few people think about it or are aware of it, but there is nothing made from human beings that does not involve a design decision somewhere. And almost everything a human being does adorns themselves with the way they navigate and derive meaning from the cities they live in, the communities they create, all involve design decisions. And what I'd like to share with you today is, are just a few examples from my 30-year career as a design curator to give you some insight in the type of exhibitions I have organized or been involved with and the reasons why I um, opted to do those exhibitions. Because as you know, it's a tabula rasa, it's a blank slate, and it's, um, there should be a very strong, compelling reason, I feel, as a curator, for taking up that real estate in an institution, asking people to go on the journey with you to think about what you are putting forward. So this um, image I have on the screen, and most of the images I'll show you are just representations, one or two representations of particular shows. Um, I'm going, what I'm going to do is talk about my shows, but they're all in groups and they're all arranged around ideas. And the first group has to do with, with ideas dealing with social needs or pushing new technology. And in 1988, I organized an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art called Designs for Independent Living. And it was a very particular title, a very specific title, because I wanted to send a message. I wanted people to realize that suddenly we can now start to find designs that really facilitated the way people with disabilities could access society. Suddenly we started to find products that were emerging on the market that allowed people to live more independently they were beautifully designed, beautifully made. They weren't the clumsy, clinical, makeshift products that most of us were familiar with and still see a lot of today. And these products gave people dignity. I think the wheelchair is a very perfect example because up until about that time, the attitude for many designers, for many people, was to design to the believing that people were not able to do things. So their designs were, that was a, the, the point of view from which they started. But what happened in the late 70s, early 80s, is that they started to focus on what people can do to design objects to allow them to live independently and to be able to do more things on their own. And it opens up, uh, it was a very popular show. It traveled to 14 venues in the United States. This was pre-internet. Um, and it really is, it's still a very unexplored, undeveloped field that has a lot of potential for the future. So do I have that? Okay. Technology, one of my favorite topics uh, going back many, many years. Um, technology does not have a form and we must give it a form. I'm also very interested in finding beauty in everyday objects, and nothing is more pervasive in our life today than the microchip. And I started um, looking at microchip patterns, which most people hadn't seen outside of the, these uh, semiconductor firms, and just discovered the most beautiful, glorious, complex patterns. In fact, these are icons of our time. They, are, they represent everything about efficiency, optimization, speed, that we value in our, in our industrial culture. So I, I had an exhibition, um, it's, in fact, it's the first exhibition I've ever organized in which the actual products were much smaller than these representations of them. The, the chips, as you know, are about the size of a thumbnail, and they are, they are, they are an exploration into the microcosm. And these computer-generated plots, I've just shown a couple of them, 
are complex maps that the engineers use to really study the, the design of the chips. And they talk about them much like architects and, and, engin and developers talk about real estate in terms of efficiency and space and optimization. At the same time, this is a, this is a long uh, silicon crystal. It's about that long. And at the same time, I realized that there was really a material revolution going on. Suddenly, we were able to start not designing the materials and designing properties into the materials to learn how to grow a, a crystal so it was perfect all the way through so that there would be no defects on the chips. The next group of images have to do with, with individual designers or companies who are exploring new, who are really pushing the barriers and exploring new methods of fabrication and um, materials. In the late 90s, I organized um, with my colleague Matilda McQuaid at the Museum of, Mo of Modern Art an exhibition on contemporary Japanese textiles. And this beautiful installation was designed by Toshiko. We had a wonderful time working together. And it was the reason we decided to do the exhibition is that we were, had been traveling to Japan. And every time we went there, we kept seeing more and more beautiful, innovative, contemporary Japanese textiles that were really building upon Japanese traditions of textiles. Designers exploring new methods of finishing, new materials, taking materials as banal and as cheap as polyester and suddenly turning it into these just gorgeous textiles where the, where the designers would, would shrink the material, they would impose different properties on it to just create these new forms, new textures, just beautiful materials that none of us had seen before. It, was, it really was quite a revelation. Earlier I, was, I said that technology is something we must give form to and I think about a couple of the comments from the previous um, presentations. This is one of my favorite calculators from 1972 designed by the wonderful Italian designer trained as an architect, Mario Bellini, who shortly after he graduated was employed by Olivetti, who some a company that many of you might not have even heard of. Um, but they were designing beautiful technology at the time. And this was right at the cusp of the technological revolution when products were moving from machines to electronic products, from gears to actually, actually products that that silicon chip made possible. The silicon replaced the moving parts. So you have a material replace moving gears. Con in contrast to our Apple products today, or at that time, the B&O um, Bang & Olufsen products from Northern Europe, the Italians wanted to add a lot of fun to their products. They wanted, they had, they added color, they added joy, they added very sensual um, qualities. This marvelous rubber membrane, when you push it, is almost like tapping a nipple. It's just give joy to the user. Another very controversial Italian designer who I whose work I have admired for years is Gaetano Pesce. And he again, he too anticipa anticipated in the 60s, early 70s, many of the issues that designers are concerned with today. I just, because I'm talking to designers, I wanted to show you this marvelous installation he designed, small one room installation that looks like a still life and it's just covered with his own products. For example, in this vase he created, one of my favorites, it's really, focusing on the idea of mass, mass customization. How can you achieve um, differentiation using mass production techniques? No two, mo no two vases are alike. They begin with the same mold, but different people pouring the resin, different colors, no two are alike. Another wonderful um, designer, contemporary designer, pushing new technology is the French designer Patrick Jouin. This is one of my favorite chairs from the last decade, and I think it really um, is a precursor to a lot of what we're going to see in the near future in printed technologies. Graphic design is another area that I was not involved in this show, but this is a, an exhibition that Cooper Hewitt, our curator Ellen Lupton, organized with Andrew Blauvelt at Walker Art Center. And what it is really, the show really, addressed was the last 10 years of graphic design and how graphic design has turned 
from a field of a very specialized discipline, thinking about the last presentations, to one that is, com that is content driven by the user, by the designer, designer becoming the producer. Designers no longer having, starting with a design brief that they are given by a client. Another grouping, and I'm almost finished, is, is um, were some shows I have organized that really look at values, designs that we are addressing today that date back many centuries and cover many cultures. One of them was masking traditions, and I've done two shows on masking traditions. The first one at MoMA was on 20th century industrial masks that were designed to protect. We always think about other cultures, indigenous cultures, as being the ones to mask. But I guarantee if you look at the New York Times for the next three months, every day, by the end of those three months, you're going to have a stack of images of masks, beginning from the front page, whether it be military maneuvers, terrorist activities, going to the sports page, the different sports. Um, you go to the movie section. Uh, you go to the theater section, you might go to the health section. These are masks that are about our culture. And the one mask, these are portraits, really, of our technological society. The previous mask I just showed you was one designed by police who wear it when they're doing things like drug raids. How would you like to be woken up in the middle of the night, have someone knocking on your door, and to open the door and see someone wearing that mask? inspiring fear like a lot of the traditional masks. The other exhibition that I'm working on right now with my colleague Matilda McQuaid is for the opening of the Cooper Hewitt is on tools, um, which are the first objects that human beings ever designed. And this will span many time periods and cultures. Um, and it's really absolutely fascinating to read. Not only they are all design problems, they're designed to function, but what do they also say about our cultures? And I know in the interest of time, I'll let you just think about the comparison of those two. This last group um, I would just like to call your attention to because it's where I'm focusing a lot of my attention now, and I would be absolutely remiss at this moment if I did not acknowledge the Loeb Fellowship and what it allowed me to do, and the step that it allowed me to take as a curator to really pull together a lot of my disparate thoughts and my, different, my work in, at that time, the city of St. Louis, and really focusing on one of our pre-industrial American cities, and how can we help to recalibrate it, to reactivate it. And coming here to do my Loeb Fellowship, it really opened my interest in, in other parts of the world. And I happily joined the Cooper Hewitt shortly thereafter, which had just started to embark on this series of socially responsible design, looking, dealing with that 90% of the world's population who has not been addressed by professional designers. And it has opened up a world of opportunity, um, and, it's act, and it is presenting us with some of the most profound challenges facing us today in our world, many of these social challenges, global issues, environmental issues, climate issues. Thank, Thank you, Kara. Joseph? I'll change this. See, we can have this panel for the whole day. And you can imagine, everybody is just uh, such an accomplished group of people in this panel. It's an amazing group. Can you find me? You know, I, I, um, I should have self-imposed this um, but I had thought about doing this Pecha Kucha style, which I think is actually a really nice way to keep it moving, but to cover a lot of territory in yeah. a short amount of space. For Something maybe for the future. So for the next one. Yeah. All right. I seem to not be able to get my notes up, but that's okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for making this panel possible. I think this is a really interesting conversation to have, especially in an institution that's so devoted to architecture, to understand how um, maybe the language has started to shift in our common understanding. Um, I am one of two curators of architecture and design at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, uh, which was founded in 1934 and since 1936 has been consistently 
exhibiting design and the applied arts. Uh, but it wasn't until 1983 that we actually established a collection of architecture and design. And so we're, we're one of uh, a, a kind of a, a small handful of institutions nationwide that actually maintains a collection of architecture and design and, and looks at architecture and design as, a, as kind of maybe a tool to both preserve and to exhibit uh, for education uh, and for inspiration and all of these other things that I think we'll, we'll all talk about together. Um, my role is to both create exhibitions but also to build the collection. Um, and I think just for my, my quick presentation, I wanted to, to select four exhibitions and four corresponding acquisitions that kind of deal with the topics and, and the intersection there. Um, this image is of an exhibition called Para Design, which is from 2011. And it marked kind of a, a collecting uh, strategy, um, maybe uh, kind of a, a collection summary in a way. And it's, it's kind of what sets the SFMOMA attitude aside from other institutions. So this exhibition really looks at the intersection of design and art and architecture practices uh, beyond what we typically consider design. Um, what we've focused on throughout, I think all of the curators at SFMOMA uh, is on the experimental and on the conceptual. And so this exhibition brings together all of these different ideas, be it through uh, architectural photography that kind of misleads the eye or through architectural renderings that are of uh, the impossible kind of space or of objects that are actually designed by architects but resonate through an architectural language and kind of can encapsulate uh, everything that's within a building but within an object. Um, and I think actually that's, that's Sejima right there. Um, this is an, uh, uh, let's call it an object um, that we acquired through that show. This is a chair by Forrest Myers called the Parker Chair. And Myers is really thought of as an artist. He was trained as a sculptor. And sometime in his early career, he started to explore uh, utilitarian objects, um, but still in a very sculptural sense. And for me, this intersection is really what the conversation about design um, can be. Uh, maybe it's not exclusively about this, but um, when you look at, at this object, you're, you're, you're greeted with a sculpture, but you're also able to comprehend the idea of something that you can sit on or something that you can use, yet it's not bound to any kind of traditional relationship to what we would consider design as, as we've been so led to believe. Um, so this definitely fits in to the experimental mold. Use this. Um, alongside the exhibition Paradesign, and I'll, I'll note that uh, the term Paradesign was kind of coined as an attempt to really define our collection, uh, para being a prefix that obviously means about or around or adjacent to, um, but combined with design opens up uh, a new possibility for um, the unexplored or the experimental or this intersection, um, and maybe even the transdisciplinary, um, which is a, a word that I have a love-hate relationship with, uh, something that says that we are breaking down the, the defined language of disciplines. Um, and so adjacent to this exhibition was a show that we did on Tobias Wong, um, the, the late Tobias Wong, who had passed away just before the exhibition here and so we we gathered together about 30 of the objects that he created and if you're not familiar with Tobias Wong he was uh, educated as an architect and then went to Cooper Union to study art and actually uh, his practice kind of evolved out of both of these different maybe disparate schools of thought and into a kind of design methodology that wanted to look at social issues perhaps with maybe a kind of a bad boy lens um, and so a lot of these objects take on uh, specific things, uh, issues like the idea of luxury and commodity or the idea of safety. Um, and so we, we were able to acquire this amazing object here, which is called the Bulletproof Duvet. 
Um, and this is really coming out of a post 9-11 world um, where safety and security were paramount, uh, really on, on the cusp of, or on the, you know, on, on everybody's mind. And so Tobias created this object that would uh, play into this quest for safety. And it's, uh, it's actually a duvet on one side, it's felt, it's actually meant to be used. And on the other side, it's Kevlar. Um, so it's, a, it's an object that really toys with our perception of um, what's the role of design because, you know, is this a practical object or is this really meant to, to spawn a conversation? Um, maybe 180 degrees from that is an exhibition that I curated. It was a traveling exhibition that made its final stop in San Francisco um, uh, called Less and More, the Design Ethos of Dieter Rams. And Rams is definitely a, a seminal figure in industrial design um, and you know, not really playing with concept uh, in the way that obviously Tobias Wong was, but something that for me was really important to bring to, to San Francisco is uh, you know, kind of a lens, a historical lens on why design is important and especially now, why design is important now. So the exhibition gathered over 200 of, of the objects throughout Rams's career and also paired it with uh, an additional small gallery that was kind of devoted to contemporary designers dealing with the influence of Dieter Rams, uh, either influenced directly by him or by his kind of 10 commandments of good design uh, or by uh, kind of an aesthetic of reductionism and of utility. Uh, and so we, we were able to actually acquire this incredible object, which is a heater. Uh, the designer is, is in the crowd, Leon Ronsmeyer, um, which succinctly captures the idea of utility, um, also captures the idea of, of new technology um, and environmental uh, attention to, to portability, uh, flat pack, deconstructability, uh, but also really a, a concise aesthetic of uh, kind of reductionism and um, the, the tenant that Rams really put into play was that design shouldn't overpower. Uh, it should be able to uh, be versatile enough so that a, a user could, could put it in the middle of the living room or put it uh, away and it could disappear. Um, and I think that in terms of uh, maybe a strict understanding of design as, as object or design as, as, uh, as commodity maybe, uh, this is a really important topic to look at, uh, the influence of ROMs, perhaps, and uh, its impact on contemporary design. We can all think of, of Apple, for example. Uh, and then this is kind of a final um, exhibition because it's the exhibition that's currently on view. This is called Field Conditions, um, and it's a little bit of a departure from the topic of design, but I wanted to introduce it anyway because it's on view currently. Uh, it's an exhibition I curated that deals with the subject of space and uh, looking at the ways that both artists and architects deal with the concept of space, be it infinite, uh, be it patterning, uh, be it uh, experiential. Um, so what you're looking at here is a work on the ceiling by a Mexican-Canadian artist named Rafael Lozano Hemmer that actually tracks your location as you move through the gallery. And what you're looking at on the floor is a piece by Tauba Auerbach, um, which is, a, uh, you can think of it as a, as a slice uh, within an infinite landscape of chance of 50% black and 50% white uh, tiles. And so both of these pieces kind of deal with this idea of uh, extendability or of the infinite, which in a way is spatial and in a way by being spatial is architectural. And I think I can, I can maybe introduce that idea of this transition of language uh, as a way to think about design. Uh, while this is not explicitly architecture, it is very architectural. Um, and while you know, maybe you can think about design as not necessarily being explicitly utilitarian, for example. Uh, and just to, to conclude, um, this is a, a large drawing by Lebius Woods, and we'll all know Lebius Woods as an architect, yet he's never designed a building. Uh, and so this is a drawing that, that plays definitely with depth and space, and the attempt on his end was to create a drawing of a certain scale that you can actually 
uh, essentially enter into by getting close enough so that your peripheral vision is uh, diminished and, and you become engaged with a 2D space in a kind of an, in a three-dimensional way. Um, so, yeah. And I'd also like to thank Aviva Rubin, who is a, uh, a recent graduate of Harvard, who was my research assistant on field conditions. Thank you. I think she's here. Thank you. Uh, Merle, do you, uh, why do you have a question? Can you help me with this? Uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, if any of this is relevant. Um, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm, sometimes I feel like I'm going to explode. I'm becoming a sort of terrorist. Um, I'm trying to do you it gracefully. Like one, <laughs> well, um, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, because I was bumped from this other panel a couple of days ago. Uh, I which I welcomed which, <laughs> which I appreciated. I appreciate it. I, I, I must admit I, I correctly or incorrectly or politically correct or unpolitically correct consider it an upgrade. <laughs> but uh, now I'm, a cu I'm sitting with the curators. And um, uh, uh, oh, I don't know. Are you regretting it now? <laughs> no, no, no. I'll, and I'll go very. Uh, this, this might. Can you stick? Murray Moss. That's probably me. I think. Harvard presentation. Yeah, that looks like me. Yes. And then you do this to go to the cool. next. You go that. Okay, but before we get, if we even get to any of this stuff, the I, my, I have a, a love-hate relationship since I can remember with museums. I grew up in museums, and I learned from museums, they inspire me. But it's, it's uh, I opened this shop in 94, and I immediately uh, was gonna sell it to uh, MoMA. Um, because the job that I really wanted to do, and Ron Lauder was the chairman at the time, and brought me in, and uh, I spoke to Glenn Lowry, and I uh, met with all the curators. And what my ideal job was, what I realized I really wanted to do, was to curate the gift shop. Um, because, because dealing the majority of objects, because it's all wrong. Um, the, these things, we're not talking about heart valves. I wasn't talking about medical equipment or life-saving equipment or things that have since become topics of discussion. Um, waste issues, things like this. We're talking about, and I use the term, so forgive me, but I've always used it to represent everything on earth that's designed, fruit bowls. And I thought that these are dead, inanimate, stupid things which people use as a canvas for sometimes quite profound ideas, like books. A book is a thing, but it's not the point, is it? And sometimes books, metaphorically, I, I believe people design them to be overscaled so they don't fit on the shelf. So they don't, so, so our existing architecture cannot contain those ideas. Sometimes I like when people hang something really ugly because the wall isn't ready yet. The wall wasn't thinking ahead for this idea. The reason I wanted, and I went in and I wanted to go in at uh, the salary to match Glenn Lowry as a directorship and a curatorial position because I felt that, as I said, this was a critical aspect of conveying what was, that you can't take a Rothko and make it into a postcard. It's, it's not gonna do it. And so what do you do? Well, I have a couple examples. Um, I went to the Reich Museum and I saw Night Watch, Rembrandt's Night Watch. And I went to the gift shop, which I consider, consider a curatorial department of utmost importance. And I saw Night Watch as a chocolate bar, either dark chocolate or in milk chocolate, <laughs> which was car, I mean, it was like a relief of Night Watch, not a painting. But here's the point. You eat Night Watch. It's a treat. It goes in your body, it adds weight to you. You get a rush from it. That's Night Watch. I went to um, Stonehenge 
and I bought, I collect souvenirs, and I went immediately to the souvenir little part underground, and I bought a, an eraser, an eraser that said Stonehenge. Now think about how brilliant or idiot idiot that is, that you would use an object that erases Stonehenge. I thought that was sort of genius. Um, there was also a sucker of Stonehenge that overlapped with the Rembrandt, where it dissolves in your mouth. So in any case, um, I believe that everything, or nearly everything, the pieces that you're working on, the table, the chair, the vernacular, the architecture, the art, the non-life-saving material world are souvenirs of thinking. And, and nobody knows enough that our education system is not cross-disciplinary as it must be. We're basically ignorant. And if you, if you, if you, if you, so I believe in what this expansion of this great school is, is trying to do. Um, very, very quickly, uh, somehow I crashed into the museums. Um, and I got this gig last year, which they weren't ready for, which was at the London Design Festival. They um, engaged me to do an exhibition at the VNA. Now I'm 63 years old. I went first when I was 10. I've been every year since. So say half a century, I've been going to the VNA, and I kind of know it. And so I came up with this idea that I don't want to use the VNA. And they said, do a show at the VNA. And so I hitched up with this something way out of my depth, which was 3D printing, additive layer manufacturing, rapid prototyping, whatever you want to call it. And I hitched up with the great Belgian company Materialize and got them to do, make eight things. But here's what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to get stuck in the room at the VNA called Future Technology. I didn't want to use the VNA as a chic address. I wanted to go into the VNA and engage with those things because I wanted others to do this, to engage with those objects which I grew up with and which I loved. So I go to, I made a dress. Uh, this is, everything happened to be 3D printed, but I went into the hallowed, sacred British galleries in the Rococo, one of my favorite objects is this Rococo mirror, and I made a dress, Eros van Herpen. And what I wanted to show was stylistically, well, styles emerge and reemerge. They come and they go, but they always reemerge when they do reemerge in the vernacular, in the language, in the technology of the day. So here I have the nerve to put a dress, which is a dress, in front of this Rococo treasure. What I wanted to do was open up a conversation because that's what it's for. And the conversation I wanted to open up was think about it. How did you make, what will this do, for example, to the couture industry? Well, what it'll do is instead of all the fittings, our bodies will be scanned as they are now already at the airport. The d dress will be designed, say, in Paris. You'll go to Paris or you'll go to the Italian couture, whatever country you go to, and you'll order that dress. But you don't need to do a fitting because they've captured, they've scanned you and you're now on a file. That dress will be done and then they'll ship you not the dress when it's finished, but a disc. So UPS and Federal Express can potentially go out of business. That's what's buried in these, in these objects. Um, I wanted to go into, this is a, the, a, 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 a 3D printed, um, doesn't matter the technology, but it's a 3D printed bust of Lady Belhaven where in this, she's the third one, she exists in their collection, you're not allowed to touch her. I've always loved her, 1827 marble bust. And what I thought was, with the V&A, how do we, how do designers design, artists make art? You build on the shoulders of those that came before you. You use the information and it needs sometimes, so much effort is spent to conceal that. And I wanted to reveal that. So 
the, te the technology allowed us to go in and to scan Lady Belhaven without touching her. Guards were sent, et cetera, et cetera. And then she was captured on a file, and I sent her to the most horrible place, Stephen Jones, a milliner, a famous milliner, to design a hat for Lady Belhaven, to have the audacity to design a hat for one of their famous sculptors. And we printed her with a hat. And what happened is Lady Belhaven became a client of Stephen Jones. He went back to 1827. She came forward to 2011. Um, one of the things that didn't happen, one of, one of the things that didn't happen in that exhibition was I found a pedestal, a gorgeous Medici, Medici pedestal. And um, there is a man whose entire job, and I'm not making this up, is keeper of the pedestal. And he is to ensure that nothing gets put on that pedestal. So I said, well, let's talk about this. He said, he said, I said, he said, it's art. It's been morphed. It's metamorphosized from, a, you know, into a butterfly. It's art. And I said, I absolutely agree with you. But it's also a pedestal. And why are you denying that reality? Why does that make it lesser a piece of art? Because you could put something on it. So I was going to reveal and I had a whole rap on make repedestalize, not a word, the, this object and give it a duality and break the barriers, et cetera, et cetera. And I lost. They said no. Similarly, there was an alcove. I've been going 50 years. You enter the exhibition road entrance and there's an alcove and it's empty. But it's not decorative. It's the only empty alcove in the whole Victoria and Albert Museum. And I know at the top, it's at the bottom of the steps going up to the architecture department. And at the top of that steps is a Baroque god. And I know there used to be something in that alcove. It wasn't an accident. So there is a woman whose job is called keeper of the alcove. And she is there to prevent anybody from putting something in the alcove. But she lost because I, although I had something made to put in the alcove to celebrate the alcovity, was what I said. I wanted to actually have, and I won the argument with the director of the museum that by putting something in it for 10 days and taking it away, you would be aware of that vacuum. She actually removed it on the opening night, and I had to go to her office and put it back. So what I'm talking about, basically, is fear. Everybody is so damn afraid that, that um, I don't know what. And that's why I'm so militant. I'm just going to jump ahead to this. This is this Phillips auction that I was invited to fancy word curate. And what I wanted to do was take the most impossible situation, the most, the most departmentalized way of thinking, which is, Contemporary photographs from 1950 to 1972. English silver from 1850 to 1861. And I wanted to go in there, and it's all odd lots, and take it and make and find relationships between two strangers on a subway, both wearing white socks. So what, what my goal was, was to say, was to show art, what we collectively, for whatever reason, who cares, define as art at this moment, see if I could just oppose it, not with art, but with what we call collectively design. And not have, see if design would not punish the art, diminish it in, a, in the people's minds. And they let me do this, kicking and screaming, because they weren't really quite understanding what I was talking about. And what I, what I wanted to do and did do, this was my little victory, was to place on a table which is clearly sculpted. It's, it's, it's a table. You could eat spaghetti dinner on it. But it's a sculpture, this Martin Boss black table, not to compare it to another Martin Boss black table that sold, the last one that sold, which didn't sell very well because we were in a recession or a depression but to compare it to art, to sculpture. 
say Giacometti while I'm at it, okay? So I put the Giacometti on the Martin Boss table, and my victory is the Giacometti didn't get tarnished because of the company it was keeping. It sold for nearly $3 million, which was its high estimate, and the Martin Boss table sold for, for its high estimate of $40,000. But nobody died, nothing bad happened. And I just wanted to say one last thing about related to architecture and objects. This is a Geoponte wall unit that I used to own, now somebody else owns it, because it's sold in this auction, which I put with this Malayevich drawing. And what I wanted to do was to show that the Malevich drawing was vetted by the Phillips de Paris art department because it comes framed and because you hang it on the wall, even though, let's be honest, what it is is it's a design for a ceiling. So is it design or is it art? Well, it was declared with these two guys sitting there that this is art, so it's going to be vetted by the art. But the Geoponte, take a look at it, is furniture. So that was by the design department. So I thought I would let, just put those together and let's see what people say. The Geoponte sold for 86,000. The Malevich sold for, I believe, 150,000. But what I wanted to say about this Geoponte, who was an architect who knew what was what, was he gave us a great gift. This is my take on it. But what this bookcase is, and let's not call it anything fancy, let's call it a bookcase, is an architecture, a structure, in which he acknowledges the sloppiness, the messiness, the detritus of our lives. And he provides us with an architecture, very generously, with which to put all our crap in such a way that rather than creating the Tower of Babel, you create a piece of music. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, what a trio of presentations. And I think what's so interesting to me is Kara being a representing National uh, Smithsonian Museum, works with surveys, encyclopedic themes, and then uh, San Francisco MoMA, you uh, just as work in the zones, which is undefined. And then, um, Murray, you actually go into aggressively challenge and break the boundaries down. So three of you are always challenging the role of curators going forward. And so I really want to know for you, and I think you also mentioned use of new technology was allow you to make new objects and then recombine disciplines in a way you are not being able to do before. You uh, break down a discipline, millionaires and reproductions can t come together and so forth. So perhaps maybe since you just spoke from Joseph, I want to, you to talk about role of curators going forward, what you see coming in the horizon, and effects of technology, including the digital media and its influence. Well, that's kind of a two-part question, but for the first part, the role of the curator, I think Murray just made it absolutely evident. It's, it's about combining things to tell a larger story and, and how uh, utilizing maybe the space of the gallery or the space of the institution to perhaps educate or expose or influence or uh, I dare say inspire um, current and future generations. I think that's maybe the role of the curator uh, and to create juxtapositions that otherwise uh, wouldn't be seen. Um, and I think that's, that's where I get my joy and I think you know, it's quite evident that I think all of us really enlist that, that action of juxtaposing or combining uh, to help tell a story. Um, as, as far as technology, um, you know, it's interesting because maybe this is a bit of uh, a tangent, but the museum has often been thought of as a mausoleum uh, and less of uh, kind of a, a space of of exploration, more of a space of containment. Um, but we're entering into this realm of uh, maybe a lot more digital engagement, which could open up a lot more conversation. 
Um, so regardless of the technological aspect with the objects, I think it, it's been definitely influencing the role of the curator. Clara, your thoughts? Yes, just very quickly. Um, what's interesting is I have worked in design collections that are in art museums and um, first at MoMA. So you have a contemporary, modern contemporary design collection there. Then in St. Louis where I was asked to build a design collection in, in an encyclopedic museum. So I was head, I oversaw a traditional decorative arts department and then I brought that forward to the present. And that allowed me to have other conversations that I couldn't have necessarily had at MoMA because I didn't have the historic collections at MoMA. And, um, and then now I'm at the Cooper Hewitt, the Smithsonian's Design Museum, and so this is all design. Um, but in many ways, it's, it's the most interesting to me, at least at this point in my career and where I'm at, because it's, it's a museum that has this wonderful continuum. So the relations that Murray was just talking about, having something contemporary and looking at the historic collections, I think is such a richness. And it's, I've really enjoyed watching designers come in and use our collections. We have a series where we invite designers to come in and create exhibitions using our collection. And all of these designers, without exception, and actually we invite not only designers, but authors, artists, without exception, they all go to our historic collections. They all bring their eyes, their experiences, and they bring out historic collections and make juxtapositions that most curators I know would never make, but they are so revealing. And I think that is going forward with, with the technology and internet and having so much at our fingertips today, especially contemporary objects as soon as they're released, what's missing from that are a lot of the historic objects and these incredible archives we're all sitting on that are in the basement, that are just full of material, ready to be discovered and make use of. And I feel like we are actually just at the very, very beginning of a whole new information revolution in a very exciting and a very rich way. And so in terms of technology with Cooper Hewitt, I hope to find ways to bring some of that technology to the forefront and make it more accessible. Larry, your thoughts? What's next for you? No, <laughs> I don't know. Um, what's interesting is uh, I feel I, I'm weirdly approached by various museums now, which is odd to me. Um, but I feel like I'm furious with the Met. I love it, but I'm furious with the Met. And by the way, I think it's okay to just say that, because first of all, I have nothing to lose, okay? But I also think if we're adult, and and we, we should not just make accusations, but like say the name. So what do you think? So I'm f I love the Met, but I'm furious with the Met, because they have 5,000 years of treasures that could sing if they, a thousand different songs. These are dead objects. What are we trying to do to find out the intent of the artist 5,000 years ago? Yes, okay, that's one approach. But, but what keeps these things interesting is us. We are active participants. It is like the theater. It doesn't exist without us. And there's a, a, a extreme degree of objectivity, of subjectivity. There is no absolute truth. There is an tr absolute truth to the person who made it. And then there are all of our individual absolute truths, which hopefully day by day as we evolve, we will, have, we will change our ideas. And we will use these objects for the purpose they were intended, which was to expand and illuminate our humanity. So my job with, that I want to do next is to go into, into the Belgian Beaux-Arts Museum, go into the MAC in Vienna, and I want to put the medieval shoes over with the Dieter Rams computer. No big deal, okay? And but I want to make us. I want to. I want those things to be alive to us. That's what I want to do. 
Thank you. I think in terms of we, I was given extra time, perhaps uh, audience uh, question, I'd like to have some uh, discussion from the audience. Students. Uh, All right, I was told to take three questions at a time. At a time? I don't know. Maybe I, I, we may not have that many, but okay. We, we'll just do a few things. I have a question for Joseph. Um, you mentioned before um, curating and uh, collecting, and I'm wondering, these two actions have different meaning? These two, two actions have different uh, mindsets? Is, is, your, uh, is your work in your work as a curator? Uh, absolutely, they're 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 very different. But again, uh, as as Murray just said, there's the potential that objects go to a museum to die, in a way. And so you need to be able to build a collection with the intention of putting it on view. So when I think about collecting, I also think uh, at the same time about exhibitions, uh, and and perhaps I actually put more emphasis on the exhibition so that the object that I collect can immediately be put. Uh, into this conversation, um, but it, you know, again, it's not always the same. It's not always the case that they can be in parallel. Um, often, we're also trying to <coughs> build the collection to be able to tell a variety of stories. And uh, at SF MoMA, we have kind of a few major tenets of our collection, uh, such as experimental architecture, iconic furniture, and. Bay Area design, and so we're constantly trying to flesh those out as well as uh, continually kind of develop the archive of what we find to be important and influential uh, kind of keystones in, in uh, histories or trajectories of architecture and design. Hi. Um, Wait, one more question. My, my question is appropriate considering the environment we're in. Um, Design shows like the triennial at the Cooper Hewitt or um, MoMA's uh, architectural department, I, I find the weakest part of design in terms of how, you, how they're presented. They're models, scale models, and sometimes they're renderings, but you have no sense of scale. And in fact, MoMA had a, a residential uh, exhibit about three years ago, and the most exciting thing about the exhibit were actual full-size buildings out on a parking lot next door. Um, how do you see technology maybe framing that for the future so that uh, architecture is somehow presented in a better way than it has been? Uh, I, I agree with you that the architecture of that uh, bookcase is a, is a wonderful thing, but I'm talking about full-size buildings or sections of buildings uh, in terms of architecture. A question, how to present, uh, represent and present architecture. Anyone? Okay. So architecture is object, too, by the way. Object. Well, I, I think okay. curate, I so should take that. <laughs> so it is, it is I, you know, I have to say, I completely agree with you that um, for me, and I have done some architecture exhibitions, and I always, it's always a challenge. We can't, unlike unlike some of the smaller objects, domestic scale objects, we cannot bring a building into an institution. So it is, I, I grapple with this every time I've done an architecture show. How do I best, um, how do I best explain it? I mean, the most successful uh, experience I had was actually in St. Louis when I did an exhibition on Tadao Ando. And it was the only time I've had an ex ha done an exhibition when I had much more space than I actually needed. And it was in a very large Beaux-Arts space. And so I asked him to design something one-to-one -one scale. So he designed the entrance to this one-to-one um, -one scale, and it was a, actually a recreation of the first residence that he designed that was extremely narrow and very, very low. And it was a wonderful threshold in which to enter into the exhibition. And it, and it dealt with the sense of compression that he often likes to instill in visitors to his spaces. So, and then immediately on access, once you were in the space, um, we recreated, we actually created this reflecting pool with a sus suspended ceiling. So it actually 
had, and I went to a lot of his buildings, had a lot of the feeling of his building and um, in a very contemplative space that I think would be very difficult to get from models and, and drawings. That said, I think short of it, um, I still think architecture shows should happen and um, you can learn a lot just looking at models and drawings and, but it is a challenge and maybe, I haven't seen a good example of technology yet really bringing architectural models in space. I think it's, I think that the, a great way to show architecture has yet to be created because I don't think people are working hard enough. They're doing the model, they're doing the literal, but it's not literal. It's a disservice to it. And I think that if somebody actually cared about it and they thought about it, what's it for? If you just ask the question, okay, here's this building. Where, what seed did it grow from? Where did it come from? That it might not be a show of model, 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 model. It might be a show of who knows what, but we'd walk, because you can't, the only way you're gonna experience the building is go there. So short of that, you have to abstract it. You can't do the next best thing. You have to reject it completely and go for another, the perfume of the building. I, I, I think you have to understand that an exhibition about architecture is always going to be a mirage of architecture. Yes, you're yes. never going to uh, exhibit a building per se. Um, unless you consider every time that you enter into a building, you're entering into an exhibition of the building itself. So you're always gonna have to deal with a, a, a single generation or multi-generational removal of a representation of that building. And I think the most successful ways of exhibiting architecture is actually to invite the architect to just create an installation and, and to, to recreate the experience of space. And in that sense, then you're able to understand the intention of the architecture without necessarily having to look at a plan or a section or a model. I think the Rothko Chapel, the Rothko paintings, actually are a great exhibition of what the chapel is. That's an example of art being used in tandem with the architecture to each do a portrait of the other. I also have to mention that uh, Venice Biennale's uh, exhibition, uh, Joseph McCorek in uh, yours in Urban Think Tank, and they recreated a fragment of a part of a building in which it fully occupied, fully functioning. So in a sense, you actually did a prototype of a building, which is a language we borrow from design. And Fashid Musavi also did a projection, which is simulation, which is also the language technique we borrow from design. So your question is pertinent in terms of how architecture and design uh, borrow each other from different techniques to uh, cr create experience which is close to human experience. The last question is Ed Eigen, do you have? Yoshiko, um, I just I take slight um, exception with your idea, and it's a common one, uh, that you know, the museum is a mausoleum, and we, we know the source of that, and it, it seems to have grown tired in my mind, and. A, a, and it seems to um, make p more palatable the idea that we need to innovate, let's say, digitally or tactfully with the objects. And I'm not quite sure we've even nearly begun to exhaust the object-like nature of the things in the museums. I think we've forgotten how to interact with objects. I think um, to characterize a museum as a mausoleum also denies the life-givingness of museums in themselves. And I mean, if I'm not mistaken, it so happens the Smithsonian has, the Renwick wing has the body of Smithson, you know? So there we, it might be legitimately a mausoleum, but, um, but it was something Murray said at the beginning where he said, well, a book, well, it's that, but it's meant to be something else. And someone who studies the book, I know that there's a tremendous amount that goes into making the book the book before you ever bother to read it. So it, it, I would just caution that kind of thinking right now when, to my opinion, when one visits a museum, there's so many intrusions that uh, I wish it could be more sepulchral in, in a sense. You know. I, I absolutely agree with you. I, I, I do have to mention that the museum that I work in is a building designed by Mario Boto, which is definitely very mausoleum-like. Uh, it's very inward focused. It's kind of a bunker. Um, but I, I don't mean it as, uh, I, I don't mean to make a reference to the to the building itself. I just think that, you know, in 
an environment where you're not allowed to touch anything and you're, you're very much held away from objects and you're aware of the fact that you're only looking at a very small percentage of the objects or artworks that are actually in the collection of the museum, it, it, it tends to fall in the camp of mausoleum in a way. And I think we are now only beginning to understand the potentials of graduating outside of that mentality and into a way of engaging people uh, with many more tools. And it's exciting. It's really exciting. Okay, I think we have to end the panel now, right? Right, right. But I think it's really interesting because like now curators, it, they are challenging the architecture of a museum. So there's a discussion that's gone from design to curation to architecture and the meaning of museum. So this has been an incredibly thought-provoking panel. I thank you very much for your presentation and uh, talk. We enjoyed it very much. We have a coffee break. Right? Behind the curtain. Yeah.